I'm the President of New America, and it's my privilege to introduce Dr. George Post, whose uh, title is alone appropriate to the occasion today. He is the Chief Scientist for the Complex Adaptive Systems Initiative at uh, Arizona State University. I met him on a visit out there, and I was impressed by him in many ways. He is obviously an innovator in his field, but he's an innovator as well in constructing interdisciplinary environments for breakthrough science. He was the founder and director of the Biodesign Institute at Arizona State between 2003 and 2009. Uh, he is a Regents Professor at the university still and active in research there. He serves on the board of directors of Monsanto, a company whose name I can't pronounce but I'm sure is very important, uh, Keras Life Sciences and he's on the Scientific Advisory Board of Synthetic uh, Genomics. He's also been on the Defense Science Board between 2003 and 2009. It's really a privilege to have George Post here today. Please welcome him to the microphone. Steve and Joel, thank you very much for the invitation to join you. Winston Churchill used to say that if you were going to address people at a luncheon, you would hope that they were well-educated, well-fed, and slightly drunk. There may be something missing from today's <laughs> equation in that context, but at least I have no difficulty talking over uh, the clink of silverware because it exceeds the jeers and boos that might otherwise uh, uh, come. I'm going, Joel asked me to have a, 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 what I would call a more journalistic title. This is not the sort of uh, title I would ordinarily use in the context of scholarship, but. Uh, it is nonetheless the issue of biology, computing, and where uh, the convergence, particularly of those two disciplines with engineering, uh, comes in. So certainly our military colleagues in the room will have been forced to uh, uh, read Clausewitz on multiple occasions, but I think the, the quote is uh, self-evident, and I think it then follows to the contemporary principle that security is determined by the nature of the threats and their deployment, and that there is no single security policy that we can discuss today that will in fact address the diversity of the threats that we are playing with. We have obviously over the past two decades seen the emergence of not only a very different uh, uh, climate for the interpretation of military and national security affairs, whether it be counter-terrorism, the rise of weapons of mass destruction, and overwhelmingly the move which was unthinkable prior to 9-11 that the Quadrennial Defense Review would ever refer to defense of the homeland. Uh, for those of you familiar with the Quadrennial Defense Review, if 9-11 had occurred seven days later, there wouldn't have been a single mention of the word homeland defense, but since it was rapidly republished, homeland defense became very much a centerpiece of that particular QDR. But it does mean that the sharp end of the spear in the conduct of asymmetric warfare has appropriately moved to very specialized special forces operations, but all of the supporting technologies that go with that means that we have moved from the old Cold War metaphor of easy to find, hard to kill, to a framework in which it's difficult to find, but easy to kill once you've actually identified them, but there are some caveats. Because it's very much how do you pick out individuals, as I've tried to depict in that last issue. This is not new, of course. If you read other historians, this is Liddell Hart uh, writing on an interpretation of Lawrence's campaign in Arabia, and I think it's as good a definition as asymmetric warfare and many of the contemporary challenges that we're facing, as you could see. I should have mentioned, because this is PowerPoint overkill, for which I apologize, the, uh, all of these will be available on the, the uh, ASU website. So we've just had a new quadrennial defense review, uh, and I've highlighted in orange really the issue of what I'm primarily talking about today. Prepare, defeat, disruptive other nations. That's the constellation. And it is in that framework that there are three general principles. Technology is moving ever faster. Previously disparate fields of technology are converging. And the capabilities to master that acceleration and convergence is now more broadly vested in other economic centers of power than ever uh, before. And if we think it's not difficult to go from small time to prime time, just look at this. 
and these obviously constitute formidable vulnerabilities in the global logistical supply chain. So whether you're talking about the provision of human medicine or the provision of flat screen displays, everywhere that the global supply chain exists, it is subject to disruption with enormous military and domestic uh, implications. And I'm going to ask you to consider also a broader dimension of security. We live in the most technologically advanced and most economically advanced nation in the world and all the privileges that go with it. But there is extraordinary inequity that triggers instability. Stability may result in the need for humanitarian intervention, but the overall issue is the fact that these issues in the broader domain of what I'm going to label biosecurity, so the issue of urbanization of developing countries, security of the food supply, security of the water supply, irrespective of where you sit in the climate debate, there will undoubtedly be significant influences in relation to natural resources and global and food uh, supplies and infectious uh, disease which will be destabilizing either locally or globally that must then be reflected in military postures. So I would submit, ladies and gentlemen, what we're dealing with here is for the next 25 years, not only the need to evolve new intelligence and military capabilities to deal with overt political th uh, military threats, but biosecurity will also be intimately linked to that. And do we have enough agility in our political apparatus, or is it so ossified that we will be able to have sufficient agility in our global governance mechanisms and global commerce to be able to mitigate those? So will Greece, will Greece bring us all down is a, perhaps a metaphor uh, for that. But it's this. What is lurking in that hole of ambiguity? That has always been the challenge, not only for strategic military planners, it is the dimension of what keeps corporate executives up at night. What are my competitors doing in that black space that I don't sense? And of course, it is the essence of the research community. But I would submit using the term from the magnificent narrative of the events at Pearl Harbor, the poverty of imagination. I would submit that this is not only an enduring theme in history, but I will come back to it at the end in relation to the question that was posed earlier today in relation to national competitiveness, which I think is potentially under siege. But it is the myopia, the failure of individuals, companies, and nations to recognize that something significant, not incremental change, but truly disruptive change, is occurring. And complacency and comfort are probably the two biggest insidious predispositions to that. That's why disruptive change, why is it that someone at Xerox, uh, sorry, someone at Kodak turned down the Xerox machine? Why is it that someone at Xerox turned down the graphical user interface and the mouse, but a certain company in Seattle picked it up? Why did that certain company in Seattle say the internet wasn't going to be important, but at least they had the agility to adapt? And everywhere you look, truly disruptive technologies come about either at the margin of a field because people say, oh, that will come to nothing, or they'll never be able to say what they're doing. Or, increasingly now, the fusion points, the intercees between previously separate fields of study. And I would argue that technology acceleration and convergence and diffusion is going to create some critical new spaces, the hole, that black hole, and it's going to be filled in. And it is in that frame, biospace, systems and synthetic biology, the ubiquity of sensor technologies, whether they be on us, in us, or in the environment, connected space, brain-machine interactions we've heard from this morning, cyberspace and outer space, but the overall issue is the fact it's the convergence. This is going to create frameworks of fluidity and interrelationships that people have not really dealt with before. Not only because we are now in a global world by definition, but innovation is also global. So I'm going to use a word called transcending boundaries, emergent domains arriving from technology convergence. I'm going to give you a little primer on systems and synthetic biology, and that enables us to target things inside the body. It is also giving rise through things like stem cells to be on the threshold of regenerative medicine, human performance optimization, and overwhelmingly what was $3 billion 
a decade ago to sequence the three billion letters in the human genetic code. We are on the cusp now of portable machines to do it for $1,000 a decade later. And then you've got the various enhancement technologies and the uh, bottom right there, penultimate bottom right, is in fact a real individual. Uh, I leave you with that perspective. And all of it is, of course, underpinned by technologies, automation, miniaturization loom large, connectivity in the bottom line, our lives increasingly recordable as a digital anthropology, cognitive intelligence, and whether you live in the same reign as Ray Kurzweil, who would argue that the singularity is near, namely machi that machines will have the same capability, remarkable capabilities we're possessed with. And I don't offer any discriminatory position with regard to the three national flags I've put up there, but the Chinese are undoubtedly actively at work in all aspects of both passive usurpment of our technology as well as active exfiltration. And of course, even though I'm a US citizen and privileged to be so, having been in this great nation for 35 years, any time I can stick it to the French, I enjoy doing that. That's why, <laughs> that's why their flag is there. So, quick, quick primer on biological design. This is what we are. It starts with our genes, this remarkable thing called the genome, the programs, the 326 different cell types in our body that form 37 organs that work remarkably in most of us with remarkable fidelity over a lifetime of 80 years. But those genes encode the next thing, which is called proteins. Those proteins essentially build essentially the circuit diagrams of each of those cell types in the body and so forth. So it's how do you understand how that primary digital code in the genome builds a human being? or a mouse, or any life form on the planet, because it's all the same code, and it's interchangeable. That started in the 1980s, the ability to move a gene from one species into another. So that, of course, leads to engineering life or engineering bio, uh, bio forms. Uh, one of our esteemed uh, uh, authors here, Joel Garrow, and others have written a number of texts on the whole question of human enhancement in its various radical forms, from mere enhancement to overt augmentation to heritable, transmissible traits. Namely, that trait is embedded in sperm or eggs and then transmitted to the next generation. We are still, I would submit, I, I'm a great believer in, not I endorse, but I believe that humans are intrinsically hubristic and that someone will be playing with this technology at some point because it's feasible. So if you take the embryonic stem cell, or you could even add adult stem cells, but since we've got a new administration, I'll use the word embryonic stem cells, clearly progress is being made in systems engineering, How do you, uh, uh, tissue engineering. How do you take that cell, which when a sperm and an egg fuse to create that initial cell that's capable of giving rise to a whole human or a whole animal, what are the, what's the genetic program which is in that that then builds this remarkable repertoire of cells in our body? And very bright, smart people are now beginning to work with that technology to build something like that, which is a, a transplantable bladder. For people who have bladder cancer, you can take some of their own cells and grow it and reconstruct a bladder. Eventually, you'll get to complete, some of you at the back can't uh, read it, for which I apologize, but a xenograft is something grown from another species in this case a pig, uh, that is then non-immunogenic and be a universal donor to be put into people. And a distant future is the future organ farmers of America. Uh, there we are uh, clearly a long way from that. But nonetheless, the train has, begin to, has begun to leave the station. But human performance optimization is a subject of quite legitimate issue of, of inquiry and the military has spent a great deal of time on this and this is just one of their final reports. But basically it is looking at the level of extreme performance today, the special forces, if you, uh, but it's not limited to that. The uh, Sydney Sea Eagles, uh, uh, the, that's the Australian equivalent of the NFL, now genetically profile all their first round draft choices for particular genes. And the one gene that turns out to have the best advantage is something that enables you to pump lactic acid out of your aching muscles more quickly than someone who will get leg cramps. So they automatically profile 
in that way. So these are the sorts of parameters. But I'd like to more, I, I believe that the first impact in not just augmenting the warfighter, but augmenting human beings will be in the realm of novel materials. The question of super flask flexible uh, electronics. The next step uh, for, the I, for the iPad and the Kindle will clearly be carried portably and so forth. But it's non-reflected, camouflageable materials. The next one over metamaterials is the first generation Harry Potter invisible cloak. Namely, there's a person standing in front of those file cabinets. It, if you've got some Escher-like uh, illusion there, but that man is actually cloaked with a material that bends the light around him. Uh, so you've still got a fuzzy image, but you can see that the next generation may very well move to Harry Potterville in terms of its ability. And then this remarkable creature called the octopus and its ability to switch colors uh, instantly. What are the underlying frameworks that could permit you to create a so-called biomimetic material, something that mimics what nature does remarkably? If you think about it, across four billion years of evolution, the remarkable things that nature has managed to put in place, you know, how I'd love to be able to see in the UV, how I'd love to have gills and be able to do a deep dive Somewhat perversely, I've always thought the one thing that human beings are really lacking is a prehensile tail. I think that would be absolutely very good to be able to hang, but uh, that's a slightly different issue. But this is, this is where it's having an impact, with apologies for the slightly gross picture on the left, but nonetheless, this is the reality. Trauma medicine is benefiting enormously from this ability to develop new materials. Our troops in the field carrying extraordinary weights that would sag most of us in a 100 degree climate, not just the 50 to 80 pounds, but much of it batteries, the ability to move to low weight uh, uh, energy sources and so forth, rapid detection of nasty materials in the environment, and then mimicking the octopus in terms of switching uh, images. And I limited my comments on robotics knowing that we were going to be having a major session on that. I refer to them as 4D jobs. The dull, the dirty, which is already widely used in industrial lines, dangerous, obviously, for the military, but also detailed. The revolutions in surgical robotics are actually quite remarkable. If I was in the unfortunate position of having a brain tumor today, I would far sooner be operated on by a surgical robot than even the most gifted neurosurgeon, given the fidelity of their movement and the fact that the full integration of all three-dimensional images of my tumor would have been programmed into the robot. Uh, you'd still have nominally a human in the loop, but it, it is nominal. But I come back then to biosecurity. Bioterrorism, the infectious diseases of natural origin, and the role of environment in creating those infectious diseases. The Red Cross in the middle uh, reflects the fact that we've had 25 new diseases come at us in the last quarter century. HIV AIDS was the big one. SARS was a bullet dodged. H1N1 this year was nominally a bullet dodge, but H5N1 avian flu is still out there. But the point I want to get across, ladies and gentlemen, is urbanization of the developing world is the single biggest incubator of novel infectious diseases of natural origin that can come at us. Because those urban megapoli of Southeast Asia and South America, you have high population densities devoid of any public health infrastructure, but most importantly, they're pushing out into virgin eco-terrain where they encounter animals carrying things that we know nothing about. Every single one of those 25 bacteria and viruses in the Red Cross there are of zoonotic origin. They come from animals in, to people. And so today, bioterrorism is low probability but high consequence. And I would say that many in the military have an absolutely delusional view they can fight through it. Having chaired a DSB task force on bioterrorism, the myopia and poverty of imagination in relation to many elements of command structure is alarming. Because it's not necessarily just the battlefield. I could take out 10 ports of embarkation literally instantly because they have a civilian population and therefore force projection would immediately be compromised. But it's the other world, HIV, TB, malaria, influenza, the emerging infectious diseases, not to gross you out at lunch, but that is the unacceptable face of antibiotic resistance and we are headed for big time white water. 
we will lose more Americans from hospital-acquired infections this year, double, 100% more than we lost uh, a decade ago. And we have no new antibiotics coming because there's no incentive for the industry to develop them. And it is this, the global public health change created by rapid urbanization, high disease transmission, lack of safe water, extend it to the Chinese. You'll hear various figures cited that between 40 and 60 percent of the water courses in the People's Republic of China being contaminated not with necessarily infectious materials but heavy metals. What are the implications of that for their industrial frameworks? Just think if the melamine tragedy that destroyed the kidneys of 10,000 American cats and dogs had in fact just as easily destroyed the kidneys of 10,000 Americans. What would be the nature of the trading relationship? And this issue of global supply chains has certainly got to be uh, looked at. But I want to come back to this remarkable insight that contemporary biology is now achieving in mapping the circuit diagram of every cell type in the body and what gets screwed up in disease. Beneficent calling of the highest order, but it's the classic dual-use technology. Because if I know the circuit diagram for beneficent application, I can sure as hell target it for malignant application. And so we have to think about bio now, not just as bugs. That's fairly easy. I can go pick up anthrax in many parts of the United States by just knowing which pieces of soil to go into. You don't need to engineer bugs. You can and will. But the real issue is the fact that it becomes much more subtle to alter the biological circuits because you can do it chemically. You can do it subtly. You can do it insidiously. I'm going to come to neuromodulation uh, in just a moment. But the other issue then is this issue of the fact that targeted disruption of any body function totally changes the landscape of both chemical and biological threats. So bioterrorism and chemical terrorism today may be low probability, but tomorrow I ask you not to suffer from the poverty of imagination. Synthetic biology is to take this parts list. Every living form on the planet is composed, it's a molecular Lego. They've used those pieces in different ways to create a slime mold, an ant, an ostrich, or a human being, and there may be many behavioral links between those last two species. But the overall issue is this is mix and match. You can take genes now, build genes, and essentially have a plug and play module uh, approach to this. It starts with synthetic biology of bacteria because they're the easiest to work with. This is the threshold, ladies and gentlemen, of an entirely new industrial ecology because you can exploit natural production processes in order uh, to do that. And here's a classic example of how you in fact begin to use natural cells to produce hydrocarbons for fuel, distributed fuel processing, complex molecules, and so forth, because we can program into that cell the ability to produce the product that you want. And of course, last week we saw Craig Venter's latest uh, production of actually creating a completely new synthetic cell. So the blue bit uh, that's in that is totally made from scratch and then inserted into another cell and it takes over. It hijacks that cell and controls that cell. And so it is the question of DNA becomes like toothpaste. You can synthesize it and you can move it uh, around. So most of you, if you just read the code at the top, wouldn't know that was poliovirus. That's the chemical composition of poliovirus. But a number of years ago, a group of scientists, and I would argue myopic scientists, because they didn't think about the implications, basically took that chemical code and assembled it into that thing called the poliovirus. And that's in the public domain. And fine, it's not the sort of thing you do in the average garage, but there are any one of a number of labs that are capable of doing that. But what did that discovery do? Not only showed it was possible, but it set back the global program on immunization against polio totally. Because you can know smallpox was the first to be eradicated, polio was to be the second. We can no longer rely upon that because somebody can do that. 
So there are very delicate issues in relation to what goes into the public domain in relation to technologies of this kind. Most of the academics will say absolutely not. There's this, uh, but it's a much more complex uh, debate than that because biohackers are potentially at hand. I urge you all to just for your general education uh, to go on to the site of MIT called iGEM, the International Genetically Engineered Machine. M stands for machine. And this now is the engineers waking up. I spoke to one 18-year-old and he said, hey man, this is great. I can program wetware. Right? The synthetic genes going in to take over something. And the applications can be profound in a beneficent sense. These are these are extremely gifted young men and women, ages 18 to 25, who come from all over the world, including our friends from the People's Republic of China and other flags that I put up uh, that are gaining access to this superb technology. So then on into the infocosm, where we all live with various devices attached to us in many ways, and I'm going to link this to ubiquitous sensing, on body, in body, and in environment to create what, what the Europeans called ambient intelligence, we call ubiquitous sensing. And you may think, well, in body? Have you ever looked at a university campus of late or at large? I, I'm on the, I, I live on the campus of Arizona State University, now the largest in the nation with 67,000 semi-illiterates running around. <laughs> and, and overtly, at least a quarter of them are pierced. And that's just the visible piercing. And for them, the question of an internal sensor really is no big deal. But another way we're doing it with the titanium hip, my contact lenses, and so forth. This is just, again, the in inevitable, uh, inexorable element. Because, ladies and gentlemen, everything will become a reporter if it isn't already. As a consequence of that, everything that comes off that's reported will move faster. It will go everywhere. But most importantly, everything carries a signature. You me, we've already seen, not just for military application, GIS systems are of enormous importance in global public health to enable us to map epidemics. Long before the formal groups like CDC and so forth, we sensed a number of major epidemics because people were phoning in on their cell phones that we could assemble it long before you actually had the body count coming in to tell you exactly what was uh, going on because it's all about signatures in the context of this meeting. Who's been using explosives, bio threats? Is this someone I'm looking for? Why are certain populations inoculated against agents that they've never been exposed to? If you can find that a foreign army has inoculated itself against an agent that doesn't circulate normally, what was the rationale for that? Right? Obvious food for thought. And is this a biosignature that can tell me where someone has been and whom they've interacted with? Just think about that last sentence. Not exactly an average cocktail party fact to dine out on, but each of us is carrying about two kilos of bacteria on our in, in our bodies. That is a unique signature, and it will be unique to each one of you in this room. And you can exchange it off your skin, and I could shake hands with each of you and tell exactly who you've sh shaken hands with. But equally importantly, the most sensitive detector system you have in your body is what's kept you alive to date. It's called your immune system. And your immune system is a history of everything that's happened to you from the time you exited the birth canal, and maybe even in utero. And so by taking blood samples, you can now tell what people have been exposed to, where they've been, and what they're doing. So I live in Arizona, and we have a, a bug called Valley Fever. And we can actually, if you live in Arizona, you will be exposed to that inevitably. 99.9% .9 of people never develop any symptoms. But we can tell whether you've been in Arizona, and we can differentiate the strain in Tucson as being different from the strain in Phoenix versus Southern California based upon the type of antibodies you produce. So if someone tells you, have you been in the Bicar Valley, and they deny it, I think you can see the logical extrapolation of that in terms of microbial uh, forensics. So sensing, to reframe Robert Frost, good fences make good neighbors, I would argue in contemporary terms, 
It's good, sens uh, good sensors make good fences. Biosignatures, they are to date under leverage, but it will become an ever increasing important part of this from the battlefield to the visa line and everywhere else. So it's about signatures and you can read that dimension because what's unique about me and you? Your genome is unique even if you've got an identical twin. That will change depending upon where and what you live. What are the signals that my body gives out? At what distance can they be read? At what distance can they be modulated? And also, we come back to the friends that live on us. So the question is, if I can, in fact, modify something that goes on to you as a tag, depending upon the duration for which that little bug, that little critter lives on you for a period, we can tag and track you. And obviously, it depends upon the standoff distance. It's much easier in the contemporary technology for me to be able to monitor Joel right here rather than monitoring him from outer space. But I think you get the sense of different spectral tags for things either on the body or introduced into the body uh, un unknowingly. So if you want to locate a particular individual you don't know about, what is their distribution network that's going to supply them? What can be inserted into their logistical supply chain to enable you to tag where they are? I always like the quote by T.S. Eliot, hell is the place where nothing connects. I normally use that when I'm talking about healthcare, but at the same time, uh, this applies equally, obviously, to the challenge that the national security apparatus uh, has because we've reached a point, ladies and gentlemen, where people have no understanding of complexity, a point I'm going to come back to, and as a scientist, I rather like this quote, no ambiguity, no error. Insufficient data, Captain. Insufficient data is not sufficient, Mr. Spock. You're the science officer. You're supposed to have sufficient data all the time. And welcome to the world of being DNI. Uh, a totally unenviable job. And it's not just the fragmentation of our own silos. How do we then interact secret data with classified data into the community that could be extremely valuable? How do we interact with our allies? And this was something I recently did for the FBI in Phoenix, hence why the Phoenix city symbol and the Arizona flag are on the bottom. Because it's this, in ubiquitous sense in will drive new monitoring systems and new intelligence capabilities. You can read them all there. New tradecraft, open source intelligence will become the great cultural transition for the intelligence agencies. We heard earlier about bandwidth being saturating for people. Indeed it is, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But this information about ubiquitous information and how you capture it, interpret it, analyze it, and how does it reveal new behaviors. And of course this has intimate relationship to the obvious issue of cyber attack and vulnerable infrastructure. The national grid, the parasites of Wall Street sitting up there in the middle, uh, and uh, uh, air traffic control systems, the global food supply chain, hospitals. How often do you think new drugs are supplied to major hospitals in our healthcare network? Twice a day, on average, because this is the friction-free global supply chain. So if you actually think about it, uh, how many, if, if you were of a less generous intent as of at least 2001, how many pharmaceutical plants around the world do you think you would have to eliminate in order to eliminate the most 50 dispensed medicines for Americans and Europeans? It was 11. And one of the great things about the anthrax episode, Amerithrax, in 2001 was a very obvious sentinel signal. No one had driven a truck bomb into the plant that made ciprofloxacin, which suggested that it was more likely to be a somewhat limited episode. All of those manufacturing facilities existed in pastoral campus-like surroundings. Now they're given the same security as our nuclear power plants because of that vulnerability. Then you come to what we carry and what you each have on your desk and malware. And that is the question of what is inserted into the laptops that control your local sewage farm, your local hospital and so forth, particularly if they're manufactured overseas. But the trend clearly in cyber warfare is exactly the one we reviewed this morning. Human to human, human 
enhanced capabilities linked to advanced robots, then you go to a Kurzweilian type of singularity robot on robot uh, uh, engagement, but it is the inevitable trajectory. You notice I don't have a time frame on there, but I always like the adage in the world in which I live, if someone says it's impossible, you're likely to be interrupted by some idiot who's just done it. That's, that's the issue at hand. And I, I think that this clearly is our, one of our greatest vulnerabilities, as many people in this room know. There is a relentless probe in our, of our defense to acquire source codes. Most of our major corporations are subject to significant exfiltration of key data, not just in the defense industry. Sitting on the board of Monsanto, the agricultural biotechnology company, our genetic information is under constant cyber assault. And every industrialist you speak to that has any measure of global reach knows that that is the reality. Malware, I think it's a little likelihood of an international treaty. And I would submit, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go back to a Cold War strategy. Mutually assured destruction was the strategic doctrine for the Cold War. I believe that will have to return in relation to cyber war. You could be spending the entire GDP on this issue and still be vulnerable. Therefore, there has to be an acceptance of the principle that if you basically destroy some of our critical infrastructure, a reciprocal response will be at hand uh, rapidly. So we always talk about Big Brother, but I think it's actually Big Sis that's watching us, and it is societal information systems, ubiquitous sensing in a wireless world. Each of us, well, most of us, are carrying one or more of these devices uh, with us that become an umbilicus. Everything that we do is tracked. We could monitor where most of you have been in the past 48 hours on the basis of your cell phones, credit cards, and other monitoring issues. But look at those numbers. And obviously, it's not just the politics of privacy, but two-thirds of new products now come with some electronic component or tracking potential. And obviously, this is just a, a little bit of logomania in relation to social media and mobile media, and, and obviously, there could be many slides that would add all the other logos in, but it's this. What is the biggest design space in technology today? It's virtual worlds, and it's not played by most of us in this room. All of us have children who can only, it used to be that the distinguishing principle between us and the higher primates was the fact that we had finger-thumb apposition. No longer, we only use our thumbs. And for, those of, and for those of us who have grandchildren who demolish me on every occasion when I am at level one with my tongue sticking out of my mouth and they are at level 68 with picture in picture and the phone goes at the same time. This is a different facileness and I would argue that at another level it is going to give rise to that last bullet that I'm sure my colleague Brad Allenby will make comment on. The whole pattern of interaction with machines is changing. It's intergenerational and it is accelerating. But interestingly, mainly despite the fact that when people go onto these sites they often have pseudo-identities that are interesting psychiatric profiles in their own right, but that's a different talk. Maintaining more than one viability in the infocosm will eventually become virtually impossible. Remember the old adage about the fact that, you know, the, 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 if a dog would never be detected on the internet and the question went, do you like meat? Yes. Do you chase cars? Yes. You are a dog, aren't you? I mean, that's a little simplistic, but that element of working through a fairly easy series to identify who people are holding multiple identities is actually becoming real. But as we heard from my colleague Stephen and others, this remarkable explosion in information, not knowledge, information, is indeed one of the great challenges. But how are we going to deal with not only an increasingly diverse data stream, the volume of that stream, how, we, how will we see pattern analysis in it, and most importantly, how will we present it in the context of a particular individual's job? But I would submit, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of the kind of mind that that person has. We've we're all familiar with the nature-nurture debate, right? What are we as products of nature versus nurture? In the 60s, it was all nurture. 
right? It's all environment, man, we're all equal. Then, of course, as genetics revved up, we were then going to be merely genetic, de genetically determined robots. Uh, it's obviously some balance in between. But what is the difference? If you read Howard Gardner's volume, Kinds of Minds, he refers to the so-called Darwinian mind, named after the great evolutionary biologist Charles Darwin, probably one of the greatest acts of intellectual synthesis of all time. But Darwin was literally enumerate, as am I. I'd be thrown out of any first-year university course in, in mathematics. On the other hand, you go to the Nash-type, beautiful mind-type people, the pure mathematicians, you can literally hear circuits fuse out of them in their 20s. There goes another one. Right? They think in entirely different ways. And one of the issues that neurobiology will lead us to is different modes of intellectual processing, and I would argue against different kinds of neuronal networks. I might be smart in one discipline and profoundly dumb in another. What, are, what is the basis of Zavantism? The Rain Man type individual. Visual savants. What is the neural circuitry that permits that type of hyper amplified circuitry but then doesn't allow literally other, any other basal function uh, uh, to, to go on. Because this issue is going to be not only important for every industry, education and research, but profoundly in terms of what happens in military affairs. Just take this issue from 2007, uh, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google. In the next few years, cognition or real understanding remains a research goal. And so that mega engine is already deeply immersed in this field because, as we heard from several speakers, whatever lurks in this three pounds of jelly that sits in our head, every function is compartmentalized and is linked in very complex networks. Understanding those in terms of what are the basis of motor functions, sensory functions, cognitive states, and all that follows, language, and all of the issues that then follow, for good and for bad, will begin to be um, mapped. What's the neurobiology of decision when I'm suddenly confronted with, unfortunately, not the choice to win a Ferrari and a Lamborghini, but you take my point, you go into that symbol of American cornucopia called the supermarket. What, what is it that enables you to say yes to that and no to that? If you want to play in Las Vegas or anywhere else, what defines your sense of risk-reward? Is there such a thing as rational economics? And then, of course, what is it about the circuitry that drives any of the monotheistic religions, all of which are probably equal in their destructive capabilities? Human cognitive capacities have always exp expanded. The written language, mathematical language, the printing press, public education, the World Wide Web, but then cognitive enhancement. Everything that we do technologically cognitively enhances. us. You always have the neo-Luddites who claim that it doesn't add anything. They keep us in the land of the abacus. The overall issue is the fact that the World Wide Web is already a cognitive enhancement. I'd say that's the, the web is probably the single most important event that's happened in my lifetime. It is the greatest library of all, but then you come to pharmacologic enhancement, and then, of course, more futuristically, as we heard from Steve, more direct implanting. But you can read this for yourself. But we do use neuroenhancement. It's not just our long-range pilots are using ProVigil as a routine part of their uh, daily operations. I always like the quote from someone who said, I don't feel myself without my Prozac. <laughs> no? I mean, this, this is here. It has enormous, beneficent applications. People who would otherwise been paralyzed by medical disorder now live free and productive lives. But as neural circuits begin to be mapped, so what is the neural circuitry, ladies and gentlemen, of fear or lack of? So if I'm interested in the phobias, arachnophobia, herpephobia, agoraphobia, and so forth, and that has a common neuronal basis, and I can then introduce a drug that eliminates fear, just imagine what that could do for the Washington Redskins. <laughs> right? But flip it over, if I can induce fear, what does that mean? 
If I can ablate memory, there's a great deal of research being done in relation to traumatic disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder and so forth. But if I can selectively ablate memory, think about the implications of that. And then as we heard from Steve, these what he referred to as nail, nails in the brain, but I actually refer to as highly expensive complex neurocircuitry electrodes as opposed to nails. Uh, nonetheless, we are moving where miniaturization technology courtesy of engineers permits one of those electrodes to now capture a particular part of a network, another one captures another bit, and then you can see uh, how this begins to be linked. Now that's electrical, but as Steve pointed out, optogenetics, namely understanding genes that you can put into neurons to make them respond to light, carries an interesting number of implications which Steve touched on. And I always like this one, the Jose Delgado's work on pinpointing certain aggression targets, in this case bulls, bull is charging for the human, the switch gets thrown on and the bull stops in mid-stride. You could argue that it's certainly a little better than the conventional bullfighting, but I don't need to make a social judgment. I think you see the neurological judgment. Behavioral genetics. Is there any difference between a very good chief executive and a psychotic killer? Drive? Probably not. What is judgment? Why do we witness something in my home city of Phoenix where two 18-year-olds are pulled over for driving a car? The worst that would have happened to them was a $50 fine for tags. They gunned down the police officer. What is it about judgment? What, when all this begins, when this fog begins to lift, what are the principles that determine patterns of behavior? If some of you may remember the famous California case a few years ago where someone claimed that it was their genes that made them commit a particularly heinous crime, and I thought the judge was inspired and said, indeed, I accept the case that this is a medical predisposition, therefore you will be held in the prison hospital until a cure is found. <laughs> right? But marginal humor aside, this is a very complex issue. A number of years ago, there was something called the Dutch violence gene identified, which was a cohort of individuals in the Netherlands where one of them, Jan, would suddenly go berserk at the dinner table, take eight people to constrain him and so forth, but otherwise lived a socially ordered life. Two years later, in the old order Amish in Pennsylvania, again a Dutch pedigree, the same behavior turned up, had been witnessed and it is due to a polymorphism, which just means a genetic variation, in the dopamine 4, D4 receptor in, in the brain. So you can see how, within, but within one week, the largest state of corrections facility in the nation was asking whether we would profile their inmates. So you can begin to see how these sorts of things will create a very diffuse boundary between conventional behavior and interpretation of the law, and then, of course, something which has been wrestled with philosophically and by observers for a very long time, irrespective of historical epoch, but long precedes World War I. Are we an inherently violent species, and how far do ethnic differences predispose to different value judgments in relation to violence and so forth? Not a pretty topic, but one that will undoubtedly be engaged. Because what I hope you sense, ladies and gentlemen, is that this is all about touching the future, not just robotics, but the whole way in which every piece of information about our world is ported to us, and how will we train ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, our armed forces, our national security apparatus to be able to handle this type of issue. You see various aspects of social network analysis go on, but the cell phone is ubiquitous. You gain as much information now, those people don't know it when they're taking those pictures with their cell phone, that those signals are in fact being part of the four terabytes a day, which is picked up by the NSA that enables us to identify certain activities ongoing locally. But it then merges the hard sciences of biology, chemistry, physics and engineering and computing with the social sciences. There's always been a fashion amongst those of us who live in the hard sciences to think about those hand wavers. They're not. They haven't had the data. Now they will have the data. Because ironically, the social sciences may move to the absolute vanguard of having the most definitive quantitative data about human behavior 
courtesy of tracking off of cell phones and everything else. Anonymity, connectivity, and virality. It has its strengths, it has its weaknesses. So is the internet going to be a digital space that propagates Western social democratic type values, or is it merely a powerful tool for propaganda and manipulation? Uh, the opium of the masses used to be referred to. There are many regimes around the world that apparently abhor the dimension of sexual activity, piracy, video piracy, and so forth, but engage in it merely because it stops their own people uh, asking questions about government practice. Very delicate issue about children and intelligence collection. Children are absolutely in the vanguard of utilizing these technologies. Some of you probably remember the novel Ender's Game. Right? The kids are nearest to having polyender talents. How can we begin to examine that to define patterns of behavior coming out of the madrasas that tell us whether someone is likely to be friend or foe, and by definition, LC, ethical, legal, and social implications in that are going to be uh, profound. And then the Defense Science Board proposal to create an Office of Strategic Deception. Philosophically alien to so many in a contemporary social democracy, but it has always been the vehicle by which our foes have lived. And as someone raised the question this morning, we may try to set the highest ethical and legal standards, but what are those who are opposed to us prepared to do? Unwelcome questions for many, but we have to engage. So, wherever you look, everything is a complex adaptive system, whether it be the electrical grid, the financial systems, internet traffic, ecosystems, or the protein networks that regulate my proteins in every one of my cells in my body. You could overlay the maps for those seemingly disparate systems on each other because they represent complex adaptive systems. That drives rapid dual-use technology with both military and national security implications, economic and social, cultural implications, human identity, but most importantly, it's global connectivity and convergence and rapid diffusion that drives that. We are, at one level, right to celebrate ourselves as the most capable and, I would argue, the most generous nation on the face of the earth. And obviously that lurks in the general principle of manifest destiny in the westward migration. However, I think that comfort and complacency are overwhelming us, and I think I would cite Shakespeare there, that we've almost forgotten how to get prepared. Because, I like Bruce Mao's comment, for most of us, design is invisible until it fails. And whether it be now being played out in the Gulf of Mexico, or what other incident now would provide a PowerPoint slide. Because I would argue, ladies and gentlemen, that the curse of contemporary governments is failing Mencken's first principle. H.L. Mencken said, of course, every complex problem has got an instant solution. And it's always wrong. And that is the issue now that every member of Congress is trapped in. They may be predisposed to it, but most importantly, they can't operate outside of it. There is no, there's minimal long-term capacity now to think about issues which are best because they're also highly complex and complexity has literally been stripped from the narrative. So I would argue, some of you may know the president of my university, Michael Crow, who I think is a singularly inspiring individual, and I would urge you to read some of the things on his website. But rising to the challenges for this great nation and our allies and sustaining the Western social democracy, uh, which has evolved in the post-enlightenment period, we have to return to understanding complexity. Out of that, we have to build systems of innovation and have the agility to gain flexibility. Because I would submit, ladies and gentlemen, in relation to a question that was asked earlier, the insularity and siloed nature of US government agencies, this is not the agility that we had in the face of the Cold War. This is not the agility that we need to deal not just with military issues, but the issues of the global columns, because they get dismissed as too hard. Bullshit. It's always been that way for every generation. We have to, have to recognize that the problem exists. Denial and avoidance and paralysis, and then continuing to fund the usual suspects 
to do the things that represent the ossification of anachronistic systems is precisely why the poverty of imagination has failed every other nation and why we believe we would be exempt from it, I find quite extraordinary. That means I would submit, ladies and gentlemen, that boldness drives innovation and this country is in grave danger of losing its boldness. What mega projects can we now identify that this nation is engaged in, whether in the military or the private sector, that would be the equal of what we've seen in the 20th century? And I would argue it's timidity and preservation of the status quo that trumps boldness. If I was the CEO of a high-tech corporation, I am now held captive to my quarterly earnings statement on Wall Street, I am, and I want to go to the CEO Hall of Fame. I'm not going to crash my stock price on the basis of basically saying everything we're doing isn't going to be around here 10 years from now because I'll be on the golf course. We've clearly risen to massive challenges in the past and as a committed Jeffersonian, I would like to think that science is still a tool against uh, despots and barbarism. I hope he's right on the last one. I rejoice that the American mind is already too much open to retreat from its commitment to science but I think that I have grave reservations with regard to that. On the other hand, I will go to an even longer historical precedent, the great militarist Otto von Bismarck. Politics is the art of the possible, the calculated science of survival. His arch enemy, Rudolf Virchow, rose to the stage and said, Sir, survival owes little to the art of politics, but everything to the calculated application of science. I hope in this very superficial surf across a broad range of technologies, I've at least given you an insight to some of the fascinating vectors which I'm permitted to work on with my colleagues around the world. And in that, despite its superficiality, I hope you also see why we must also rise to challenges. And to reflect this last slide, may we be equal to the task. Thank you very much. We have time for just uh, two, maybe three quick questions before we move to our last panel. So, uh, anyone? Yes, over here. And please wait, please wait for the microphone. I guess I'll just keep it to a really simple question, so to speak. Um, you talked about the inevitable blend of the, the human and information technology. You know, some people call that transhumanism. Some people are all for it. Some people see it as an appalling danger. Your, your, your talk is so pessimistic in some ways. Do you see it as a danger? I mean, you said it's inevitable. Is there, are, do you see that there are better paths to pursue toward it? Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, sorry, it's very interesting the way people respond. Some people view this as a very optimistic call to action, namely that technology has always been the solution to complex problems. That's why I'm in it. That's optimism. I can, believe me, you're not the first to say that a talk of this kind is pessimistic. It's pessimistic because people feel paralyzed by it. That's part of the problem. And it isn't. It's because, once again, we've retreated from any willingness to understand what it requires to embrace this pattern of complexity. I'm not, I'm not citing you specifically. So transhumanism, which I'm sure some of my colleagues will touch on in the next panel, is clearly, theoretically at least, in some point X decades hence, and I've no idea what X is, all I know that even the complexity of the biology we play with with simple life forms like bacteria is orders of magnitude different from what will be required to even do some of these things with a mouse, yet alone uh, a human. Uh, clearly the ultimate dimension is, as we've said, uh, Ray Kurzweil's dimension of the singularity and transhumanism, of course, uh, would in its most extreme form uh, involve the ability to port out all the information in my brain or your brain and actually transfer it to a different physical uh, form. Uh, uh, that I think we are a very long way from, but does it have a theoretical plausibility? Yes. If you're asking me, am I pessimistic in the context that these, uh, these types of technologies will be explored? Yes. In that sense, I am pessimistic, 
because I think there's never been an example of a technology which has been identified and certainly one that can confer economic or military superiority relative to the status quo that hasn't been picked up. Our challenge, therefore, is to monitor this spectrum of technology and just as the previous panelists talked about, there's an intrinsic duality to it, beneficent and malevolent, and if we actually believe as a democratic society we should favor the beneficent aspects of that, then that's the way public policy should drive it. But just because technology is complex and technology is convergent, I reject the thesis that it's pessimistic. Yes, sir. Last question. Sorry. Uh, thank you. This, I'm Peter Shutley from Brookings. I appreciate your suggestion that we focus on the complexity, but my impression is that political social pressures on our leaders Absolutely. encourage them to do the opposite. We don't want a president who says the Gulf oil spill is complicated. We need to study it further. We want somebody who says, I have a simple solution. Do A and it'll solve it. We want a leader that get, gives us a quick answer. We don't want somebody that studies and analyzes a problem for a long time. So how, do we, how does leadership overcome that pressure to give us simple, easy, facile solutions? They will never exist. Because as problems become more and more complex, there will not be facile, unidimensional issues. And that's what no one wants to take on board. And you're, right, you're absolutely right, and it's intrinsic in my commentary, the retreat for complexity. It's an ab absolutely unenviable position to be in contemporary leadership because society has become so cocooned from risk, it's become so cocooned from complexity that just think about the space shuttle when it blew up, one of the most complex aeronautical forms ever designed. You lift a million pounds of liquid explosive off the launch pad do a balletic, balletic pur de deux as you come off the launch pad and you're doing 2,400 miles an hour after 28 seconds, that's dangerous. Right? And what do we have? We had two years of hand wringing. Who's to blame within NASA and so forth? Statistically, you could have rolled another space shuttle up onto the pad and it would have gone up. And we would have still had the O-ring investigation appropriately. Further research isn't a recipe for paralysis, but the question of I, I'm deeply saddened by what I'm now going to say. I believe catastrophe is the only way in which an com overly complacent and comfortable society begins to understand the need to change. And whether it be the rise of tyrants, whether it be atrocity on a more limited scale, such as 9-11, it doesn't matter what the disaster is. I mean, I, I would only have to do the most elementary logic and the retort given by the administration was the fact that we've ordered it. Right? That's, that's the level, tragically, at which contemporary governance now has to operate, because you can't expose the public to difficult, complex issues without the loss of your own leadership. And that's the tragedy, because many of the people who've committed their lives to government are deeply motivated to try and solve these problems, but they're trapped in this conundrum until a catastrophe occurs. And I'm deeply saddened to say that. If you actually said to people today, did the swine flu epidemic slash pandemic, was it more dangerous than 1968 and 1957? What would everyone, in the, well, let's do a poll. I've probably created a predisposing question here. Who thought that that epidemic this year was worse than what had gone before from what you read in the media, 57 and 68? For most people, it was a yawn. I won't bore you with the poll. But if you quantify it in terms of years of life lost, if the average lifespan for a female is 82 and for a male is 80, if a 20-year-old dies, you call that 62 or 60 years of life lost. The H1N1 pandemic this year, the data has just come out, was more dangerous than 1968 or 1957. What do you think the response of American society is going to be the next time around someone uses the word pandemic? I have three slides. One shows the cover of The Economist with the Grim Reaper going by. The next one shows the cover of The New Yorker, the end of the world sale is nigh. And then the, ones, the New York Post says, ho-hum, 
What do you think the response is going to be when the one we thought was coming, H5N1, the avian virus, which is still out there, when that mixes its genes with something which was like pig flu, easily transmitted, but 80% of people who get the avian flu die. It, I wouldn't want to be the individual who had to say a pandemic's coming because society won't respond to it until it's too late. I mean, as you probably, many of you are observers of this, if this was extrapolated to the 1918 pandemic, then we would have lost anywhere between 25 and 45 Ameri million Americans, million Americans, within six months. Can you imagine how this cocoon society would have dealt with that and the political leaders who were in present at that time? So catastrophe, much as I'm saddened to say it, is the true catalyst of change. And on that happy note. Thank you very much.